Hi everyone, uh, welcome and uh, thank you for joining us in today's webinar. My name is Dewi and I'm with Informa Connect team based in Singapore. Today's, um, we are uh, presenting a webinar on the topic of uh, novel disease and health insurance, assessing the impact and product pricing and innovation. And the speaker is Julian Meguel, the CEO of Southeast Asia and Regional Health Solution from Sigma International Markets. So this digital event is part of this digital event series by uh, Asia Healthcare Week event, and uh, which is happening from the 1st to the, the, 4th, the 3rd September 2020. You can uh, click the QR code on the screen to know more about the event. Without further ado, let me introduce to you our uh, today's speaker, Julian Mengual, the CEO of Southeast Asia and Regional Health Solution from Signa International Markets. Julian has been the CEO of Southeast Asia and Regional Health Solution since January 2019. He has PNL responsibility and oversight of Australia, Hong Kong, Singapore, Thailand, as well as his role in Asia Pacific Regional Health Solution business development and distribution. He's a growth-oriented leader with a track record in building businesses and has been CEO and country manager of Signa Thailand in April 2015, a period in which Signa Thailand has enjoyed strong growth and double sales. Okay, Julian, please, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Just give me a second to get the technology working. Um, and just let them off joining us. I'm delighted to have the opportunity to speak on behalf of Cigna at the sixth Asia Healthcare Week event. Um, at a time when we experienced seismic uh, change to our daily lives during this unprecedented time, um, it's more important than ever that we support our customers and our business partners. At Cigna, our mission is to help the people um, that we serve to improve their health, well being, and peace of mind. And as a global health services and insurance organization, we constantly look at the multitude of issues impacting people's health and way of life. This covers a broader range of issues, of course, from aging populations to the rise of the global middle class and its associated chronic diseases such as diabetes and heart health. But today, to kick off this session, I'll quickly um, share a little bit about who we are and who we serve before really getting to the matter in hand, which is the COVID-19 phenomenon. Our international markets business, um, Signa has an extensive global footprint. We're spread across 30 countries and jurisdictions. We serve more than 14 million customers around the world, really in three primary buying groups. The first is corporations. Uh, we serve organizations who primarily support their employees who will be on international assignments. The senior executives require more extensive regional or global health coverage. And businesses with a strong desire to improve their health, well-being and uh, and peace of mind of the segments inside their business. Globally, we are the largest health services company for the globally mobile and a leader in serving Fortune 500 customers. Second, we're a market leader in serving governments and non-government organizations, uh, inter-government organizations as well. And we support these employees both locally and overseas. And finally, we serve directly to individuals, providing a range of supplemental health, life and individual private medical insurance plans. These groups share really three specific concerns. One is about access to affordable healthcare. It's top of mind for our clients be it in the US or overseas. Secondly, given the complexity and importance to individuals of healthcare, simplicity and ease of use and access are critical. And then finally, allied to this desire for simplicity is a desire for predictability. This is often healthcare costs are opaque, Individuals are uncertain what the cost will be at, for different treatments and have concerns over clear understanding and the predictability of those costs. We bring those three things together and key to our success has been our ability to leverage global best practices and apply them in the most appropriate way to make them locally relevant to the customers and clients we serve around the world. We think global but act local and we place the affordability focus at the centre of our agenda. However, for today, we are facing the emerging pandemic that's still with us of COVID-19. I intend to quickly walk through some insights um, associated with that, um, highlight some of the work that we're doing on product development to respond to this challenge, um, some thoughts on the impact on the insurance market, and some of the learnings that insurers have gained 
in trying to mitigate these risks. And, and lastly, I'd love the opportunity to take any of your questions and hopefully do my best to maybe respond to them and give you some further insights where I can. As the COVID-19 pandemic continues, we firstly appreciate the effort of the frontline workers who continue everywhere to offer um, their dedicated care to our cu customers, but most importantly, help protect the communities that they serve. As an organisation, we, as I said earlier, committed to health, well-being and peace of mind of both our clients and our customers. And during this uncertain period, we know it's more important than ever that we focus on delivering safe, efficient and quality healthcare. To honour this commitment, I'd like to share some of our recent initiatives that support our customers and partners. These have included one, waiving all the cost share related to COVID-19 screening, testing and treatment, as well as telehealth screenings being made available to all of our customers, making it easier for them to be served virtually and to have access to those relevant services, be it routine medical examinations or, or otherwise. Uh, additionally, we've been providing free home care delivery of up to 90 day supplies of medications uh, through our partners and our pharmacy divisions and also giving uh, our customers access 24 7 to pharmacies. Um, we've also been working globally on supporting hospitals in the process of transferring patients to long term acute hospitals, skilled nursing facilities and acute rehabilitation facilities to help manage the demand of increasingly high volumes of COVID-19 patients that are in the healthcare system today. We've also been supporting Cigna docs and nurse practitioners who wish to support their medical communities. And we supported customers with free interactive COVID-19 tools, both to assess the risk, but help them to prepare and stay safe. Um, in Asia, we've also extended our services to also focus at health at home. So one of the initiatives in Hong Kong has been focused on making sure that customers can get access to a COVID-19 test from their home. But secondly, for those customers with treatments such as cancer, making sure that both virtually and in their own home, we're bringing that service to them so they don't miss out on important treatments during this time. And they also have access to virtual telehealth services where they can speak to a doctor virtually. These are all important because one of the big um, challenges with COVID-19 is people staying away from hospitals and therefore not having the regular treatments they should, which leads on to other challenges. Since the outbreak of COVID, the COVID-19 pandemic, we stepped up those efforts both for customers, employees and the general public. Two key developments have taken place. First and foremost, as mentioned, consumers are being very cautious. They're avoiding contact with large groups, generally, which means uh, not spending the time in healthcare facilities they usually would, given on their concerns on potentially uh, both contracting COVID-19, but at the knock-on effects of this. Secondly, the impact of this has been reinforced by access to facilities being reduced to stem the flow of the virus. The only intended result that I referenced is that some customers aren't managing their chronic health conditions as closely as they usually would, and maybe are potentially missing treatments. This, um, if unchecked, will become a big issue later and decline their health. Um, access to digital services and removing that barrier of physical location to create safe interactions has been a key focus for us, supporting health needs during this disruptive period. And as part of these efforts, our telehealth downloads have risen about 130% uh, and logins have increased uh, in just the first quarter alone by about 134%. Um, we're seeing customer usage of telehealth increasing globally by about 500 plus percent over this time. This is where consumers are now accessing medical practitioners through their phone, through their screens, and getting advice and services, including, including receiving pharmaceuticals and medicines delivered to their own home. We recognize that the online, uh, online and teleconsultations have become essential as clinics and hospitals in some cities and towns across the world have become overwhelmed with patients. And so being able to talk to a doctor even through a simple phone call via video or landline has also proven especially vital for patients in, in particular in those rural areas um, due to the lack of healthcare otherwise. In addition, in markets where regulations per permit, as mentioned earlier, again, we spend a lot of time making sure we are delivering uh, medicines to someone's home and enable them to manage those chronic diseases. Um, and I mentioned earlier our cancer care program, so Cancer at Home, which is really about bringing that home care for people with chronic diseases and helping them manage their conditions. In light of the increase in the appetite for virtual health, we're continue, continuing to invest in newly integrated healthcare solutions. And we, as we think this is really a permanent shift in behavior, as much 
more people will want to manage their health, both their body and their mind, by getting the treatment they need whenever and wherever they need it. Um, COVID-19, though, is not only impacting access to healthcare, it's also having other impacts given consumers have spent unprecedented amounts of time managing the impact of the pandemic and adjusting their way of life. Lockdowns where most people are not able to even exercise their daily lives are being uh, experienced by many of us across the globe. The impact of this has been a, has been a real focus of ours, especially in the area of chronic stress. Given that chronic stress is a universal issue, we've been focused on for now a period of time. Uh, since 2014, we've conducted a 360 wellbeing survey, which tracks people's perceptions on their health and well-being. And this year, in partnership with Kantar, uh, Kantar being a leading market research company based out of Hong Kong, we launched our first COVID-19 global impact study back in May. This is an extension of that 360 wellbeing survey I referenced, and it really was trying to ascertain the impact on the pandemic on people's well-being and across the world. Key findings between January and April have highlighted some very interesting findings. Overall, there's been a decline in loneliness, improved personal work relationships where people actually feel closer to their colleagues during the pandemic. Although balancing that, there has been a, an increase in what we would describe as the always on working culture, which is very prevalent, particularly in our Asian markets. So this is where people are constantly checking their phones, their WhatsApp messages and other social media messaging services to make sure they're keeping on top of their work and, what's, and keeping in contact. This means they find it difficult to switch off at home and that's before taking into account all the other care that they give to others, be it children or their parents themselves or friends as well. Oh, but as I mentioned, we have seen an increase in the appetite for virtual health. Our study also revealed people are more interested in telehealth services for general practitioner appointments, as well as mental health support. Um, and in our latest research, which will be released in July, uh, we'll, uh, we continue to see more interest in those virtual health services. Although financial matters were the key factor driving both stress and pessimism about the future. Again, these survey findings really do tie back uh, to our own experience and the experience this is having on consumers. First and foremost, consumers have been very interested in increasing their healthcare coverage and making sure they've got access to the right healthcare services as a direct response to this pandemic. Um, that uh, trend though, overall, overall has been then shaped by a focus on affordability. So the first instinct and, and need was, how can I increase my healthcare cover? How do I, my range of ways of accessing healthcare and the depth of that healthcare service? The second wave has been then as the economies have started to feel the pressures of lockdowns and other pressures and economic indicators have been uh, very muted, we've seen consumers spend a lot more time focused on that affordability and how much money they are spending on different services. So wanting the broad range of cover, but looking to do that at a lower cost in the future. And so we see those two trends as very important as we come out of the first half of the year. Um, and we're seeing um, very deep insights and valuable ones as a result of this that help us understand the impact the pandemic is having on people and how people deal with a crisis like this will be very personal. And of course, people continue to experience over this time high levels of anxiety, confusion, and to an extent in some cases, a sense of dread. These insights are helping us guide how we can adapt to a post-coronavirus world and how we continue to support our customers, but also very importantly, our employees, as, we, as members of our, our group start to return to work, uh, in some cases, to the best of our ability. As we continue to grapple with the impact of COVID-19, we expect a continued underlying impact on insurers, and we expect that to become a lot clearer over the next few months. The consequences uh, are clear in the sense that they're there, and present, but insurance should start to prepare for the future. One area that I would expect to see significant change is the acceleration in a trend that's been apparent for a long time, which is the use of digital services. So the digitization of operations and planning for business opportunities this creates, but also again, to be very responsive to the needs of uh, consumers. We expect different lines of business to be affected at different times and in different ways. And we expect that largely in three waves. The first wave is new business in most lines of business will decline. 
as potential customers lose income and are hit by financial difficulties, as I touched on earlier. In the second area, we'd expect, whilst claims initially will decrease, we expect they will increase following insurable events from the pandemic, uh, particularly in areas such as trade and credit and life events uh, and event cancellations. That said, in some areas, um, in the short term, we'd expect claims potentially to fall uh, before increasing later. And in the third wave, we'd expect to continue to see an increased demand for insurance products that directly address some of the insights and some of the challenges consumers and employers face today. And after the pandemic, we'd expect consumers and their lives to change somewhat and for them to be continue to be averse to risks and take out more insurance to protect themselves. And again, we're seeing a, a uh, for the most important thing many people think about in their lives from a personal perspective, their health and what that means for their family, we're seeing a significant demand for people to protect themselves. It is clearly unclear how long it will take until we enter uh, the new normal. Uh, this is referenced in the media a lot, but the reality is we live in uncertain periods. Only five weeks ago in Hong Kong, cases were negligible and people had to spring their step and confidence Five weeks on, uh, the reaction is very different as the number of cases had increased temporarily, causing people to be concerned and pull back from some of the normal activities they would involve themselves in. Um, but it's clear coronavirus is impacting our day-to-day -day tasks. However, there's some clear learnings from my perspective from the pandemic uh, and particularly in the business world, which I will quickly call out. First and foremost, I think responsiveness is a big one. The ability to respond to changes in the needs of consumers will be a critical capability for successful organisations. Uh, this requires organisations to have both deep insights to their customers, so in other words, to be very close to them, but also engage with their customers with an appetite to make change at pace. As long as alongside this deep customer focus, there needs to be matched by responses that are locally relevant to the segments being served. And to do that, will require processes both externally and internally to be simplified significantly to increase the pace of decision making that supports the ability of an organization to respond at pace to changing cons cons customer needs that are well understood with services that are highly relevant. During a period of prolonged and uncertain disruption, navigating these changes will also require a lot of courage as there aren't playbooks or rules on how one should ad address these changes and how one adapts to what is a one in a lifetime situation. And so it's about then having the confidence to make the key decisions and adjust them rapidly in the face of unfolding customer responses. Finally, this period has highlighted the opportunity of digitization and will necessitate, as I mentioned at the start of this, an acceleration in the deployment of digital services. For insurers, this highlights the need to embrace implement new technologies and also accelerate those plans to help their operations run smoothly both through the crisis but, but prepare themselves for doing business post the COVID-19 world. It's also important for insurers to recognize and harness the benefits of that technology to continue to bring peace of mind to the customers they serve. That will in, include increasing client outreach, using digital distribution channels and accelerating their own digital transformations will be essential. There'll be knock on the benefits from this as it provides insurers with the opportunity to reinvent their relationship with customers and deliver much deeper insight led relationships supported by tailored services relevant that are relevant and provide affordable access to high quality healthcare. There's also reason for optimism um, in the response post COVID as we see communities come together to serve uh, each other. The acknowledgement of the contribution of others such as healthcare workers is a great example of that. So again, a significant period of change, uh, really challenging the way that insurance services are delivered, but also a really big opportunity for the industry itself to reinvent itself and create that relevance and level of customer engagement, uh, deep insights to ensure that we're making the different change to support the communities we serve and make a difference to them. So they would be just some insights from, from my perspective over the last, say, 20 minutes. Um, at this stage, I want to take a pause. Um, they're the key highlights of the presentation itself. And I'd love to have um, the opportunity to take some questions and feel, feel free, please, to, to raise some of those questions as we go.
Yeah, thank you, Julian. We will go ahead and take some time for a question. Just a reminder, everyone, please be sure to type your questions into the question box in your control panel. I think we have a um, few questions now. The first question would be, um, providing all the additional facilities to support customers during the pandemic is good. However, from an internet, inter internal company profitability and risk perspective, wouldn't it impact the company negatively? How did Cigna manage this and release to market quickly? Yeah, it's a, it's a really good question. And um, being responsive to customers and making these changes is difficult, um, but it's absolutely critical to success. And I think um, the benefits of the approach, so to think of the two impacts, yes, by speedily changing services, there is a cost and I'll call out two examples. So in one of our businesses, we were able within 48 hours to switch on all our digital servicing capability that a customer, wherever they were on for that business, was able to be supported remotely by our customer services and all our digital applications. Clearly, um, good preparation was needed to do that, but in the time of a time of need, we were able to step up. I think what it's meant though financially is whilst there are an impact to providing those additional services and the cost of those, I think on the other hand, there's been greater levels of customer loyalty and customer engagement which also means that customers in their own need who are supported build deeper levels of trust. And by doing those things, it enables us to build long-term relationships. So I think whilst there is a cost to building out some of those services, there's also a trade-off by understanding the needs of those customers, being with them during this difficult time, supporting them. And that's actually enabling us to build long-term trusted relationships. Darian, you might be on mute. Sorry. Okay. <laughs> yeah, the next question would be the affordability of healthcare served as the primary consumer concern back in January 2020. So in the middle of the COVID-19 pandemic, how have these concerns been improved? Sorry, can you say the last bit? How's it been improved or how do we know it's kept? improved? Yeah. Oh, improved. Sorry. Yeah. So in terms of improving the affordability challenge, th there's a few things that we, we look to do to make healthcare more um, affordable. The first is the use of our capabilities in our clinical teams. So our teams spend a lot of time to identify potential illnesses that consumers will um, get and potential health trends and then put in force proactive programs to address some of those and also to increase the quality of care. So two examples, increasing the quality of care is about people managing chronic dis uh, diseases, how we support them. So if you take the example given earlier, one is by delivering their medication, regularly making sure it's being taken, delivering that on time so they don't have to go and see a doctor. So to be able to support that because we do it all virtually, that's meant a number of consumers are following uh, medical plans and continue to do that. So that's making a difference. The second, by having our health at home services, it's meaning that we're also making sure people are comfortable and we're supporting them through that journey. So that means the likelihood of them getting iller is lower because we're obviously providing those interventions. And the third piece is by delivering those digital services, we're providing solutions that are very scalable uh, and very easy to access. So when we put the access and the affordability together, it makes a big difference. And then when we add targeted programs designed to improve health outcomes with the right interventions, all of these things are helping to reduce the cost of healthcare because we're delivering an ongoing sustainable service that improves the quality of the healthcare someone receives. As a result, reducing the cost of healthcare over time. And that's a big part of our focus on making quality healthcare both accessible, but to your point, most importantly, affordable as well. You're on mute again. <laughs> yeah, thank you, Julian. Um, there will be more questions. And the next question is, how has leading insurance company like Cigna coped during the pandemic? What, what practical steps are you taking to minimize the impact? Yeah, there's two. I mean, the first I'd like to call out that's been really important for me personally, and I've seen that because again, I have people across multiple jurisdictions that work with me, um, has been really the support we've given to our employees. So I've talked a lot during this um, 
session about what we're doing for customers, but I'm very proud of some of our responses to our employees in, in a couple of ways. One was making sure that we were making uh, the necessary equipment uh, available through both cleansers and health wash materials and education around that through to masks and different things to enable our employees to stay safe. The ability to enable them very quickly to work from home. So really strengthening our IT environment so quickly that as this started to affect us in China and Hong Kong, pretty much all of our workforce was already at home. So keeping them safe in that, uh, that environment. We also have established um, COVID-19 employee assistance funds. So we put um, funding for financial hardships to support any of our employees. And when we've opened, reopened offices, we've been very careful about where and making sure we're making hand sanitizers and the like available, as well as deep cleaning of offices. One of the more impressive stuff has been the focus on engagement. So we spend a lot of time um, messaging people and connecting with our staff more than we've ever done before. So it sounds strange that we spent more time engaging with our people when they're not in the offices next to us than when they were. And so we've had a lot of what we would class as a check-in where we're checking with people just to make sure they're safe and well and how they're doing. And through our employee apps, and so some of the, the solutions we provide digitally, we've introduced virtual um, exercise classes for people to join together, either as a big group or in their own private time, as well as lots of advice and services from our clinical teams to help them improve their wellness. So from a employee perspective, we spent a significant amount of time of kind of leading the way we'd want to, managing our, our teams in the way we'd want to, and extending that care then to our customers. Yeah, thank you, Julian. That's really clear. Um, the next question would be speaking about the investment. How do you think how current global pandemic outbreak will impact investment in insurance industry? How to uh, uh, yeah. How to gain uh, investors um, trust back? Yeah, I, I mean, I tend to see it and, and maybe I'm too positive about these sort of things, but um, especially I'll speak from a health insurer perspective first and foremost. So regularly when we talk to customers about what's important to them, they'll tell us repeatedly health is top of mind for people. Now it was top of mind before the pandemic, but imagine afterwards uh, health has become even more critical as people's worry about the consequences of being sick and worry about the impacts of this pandemic both on their health but also economically if they were to become ill so from my perspective i, I would expect investment to go up particularly in health and, and the areas i'd call out are investments in the digital side of this type of organization so making um, access to care remotely and digitally much more um, focused. And so I think we'll see more health tech investment, so technology uh, receiving investment. But I, I also think that um, organizations in this space are gonna attract more attention because it's so critical. So I think whilst um, investment in some lines of business will look very different, I think that trend of digitization will continue. Um, and I think for healthcare generally, that's just gonna see bigger investments um, in other areas, I think, and certain industries, maybe outside of insurance, different areas are going to get different levels of investment. So the other big one, the big winners of the COVID-19, for example, has been the rise in food delivery to make it accessible to people. But again, that's all linked up to digital and people being safe and well. So my personal view is I think investors will continue to invest heavily in insurance um, and particularly in the health side yeah yeah thank you and the next question is from ivan uh aside from telehealth player who are some of the other key partners whom insurers like signa actively look to collaborate with to enhance customer value proposition or service while maintaining sound business performance also any hurdle based towards effective partnership or service rollout Okay, so yeah, there's definitely, I mean, we take the approach which is quite mixed and that approach is both some of the services that we will deliver ourselves, um, clearly, um, because we bring those capabilities. So a number of the clinical teams um, supporting those medical interventions will come from us, uh, both in market and globally. But of course, you're quite correct. There are a number of partners that we work with as well. Telehealth is, is a good example. Um, but beyond that, we also look at partnerships in areas such as mental health. One of the big areas that 
we've been worried about over this period and, and I touched on earlier is, is stress and people managing stress and we know in the healthcare industry today that about 20% of spend in Asia we would say is largely linked to stress and it's untrackable and so a big focus for us is also partnering with key thought leaders and experts in that space to help address some of those issues and what you can imagine during this period where people are at home they're spending all their day at home sometimes they feel hemmed in so the positives are they feel closer to their family um, which is great they're spending more time with them despite the fact they get used to calls like this where children walk across screens and we see that on our media in uh, outlets every day but on the other hand it's given an intensity and pressure and often in a lot of markets people can't actually leave the borders they're in so i think the other areas we've chosen to partner in have been around areas such as mental health and we did uh, run campaigns only last year on things such as see stress differently which was then thinking about how do we help people manage their mental health and how do we address some of the stress issues so how do we bring it to people's attention both employers and individuals and how do we make those changes so they would be areas where we've selectively partnered to add to the core of the services that we can provide yeah great and there is more questions here it's about the uh, underwriting and distribution has mm -hmm. China harnessed any of the digital technologies in terms of underwriting and distribution on um, distribution absolutely and um, so we have propositions that we were uh, particularly in health but beyond health as well that which we would deliver directly so someone can come to our websites digitally our assets and could purchase an insurance product online without actually needing to interact with um, a human being if they wish to they'd have choices such as click to chat and other types of technology we continue to invest heavily in that and we do think that's an important part of the journey however we also think as well as the digital side uh, a customer journey is relatively um, interesting in that people generally might not go online all the way through they may start offline get friends and family advice then go online research themselves and may still buy via a phone call or also other ways so one piece we definitely continue to distribute proposition digitally uh, we continue to make people aware of the services we have that way so absolutely we're seeing it digitally on the underwriting side we continue to explore how we can make underwriting more efficient um, and again through our digital solutions a high proportion of our underwriting would be approved immediately digitally but we also look at how do we dynamically underwrite in the longer term so meaning that we're constantly evolving the methods of underwriting for the propositions we offer. And again, that comes back in line with our vision that we want to make insurance and particularly healthcare simple. And to do that means we need to update the processes and the way we, we conduct business. And again, these, the, the digitization of the business and the digitization of the access to customers becomes more and more important over time. Mm -hmm. Yeah, agree with that. And uh, do you foresee any changes to claims made, possibly as a result of lifestyle changes that may persist post COVID-19? Yeah, it's an interesting question. So if I think of it, I call out two things. So the first thing, just from a claims experience perspective, we've spent time uh, in our markets trying to think about how do we make claims as simple as possible um, so the first thing that we've spent time on and, and we're actually in the middle of piloting right now is not only where you take a photo photograph of your claim and you upload it into our application, which we do today, but we're then using AI based tools to then look at that claim and approve that pretty much in real time to enable us then to make a payment very quickly to customers. So to really speed up that claims process and make it really easy for customers to use. That's a big focus for us. Um, but the second piece on where do I see claims going? Uh, really good questions. Um, what I would say to that is we continue to see a significant amount of claims tied to stress and uh, chronic diseases. I would continue to believe that as we need to address the mental health issues that we will continue to see increasing levels of claims spend tied to stress. And for the industry as a whole, it's really important that we understand how to improve the health and well-being of, of the segments we serve and how we start to address that stress and how we educate others in what they can do to do so. So I think that's a big part. And of course, I would, I'd expect to see claims 
uh, that maybe today people aren't going to hospitals. So more traditionally, uh, as the environment and the new normal comes, I'd expect that some of those elective procedures, i.e. where I put off a planned treatment, will also come back over the longer term as well. Yeah, and do you think what should insurer focus on post COVID-19? This is a quite general question. Okay, so my, my personal perspective is two or three things. So I think there's some generic comments. First and foremost, I think the lessons that I maybe shared earlier about COVID-19 are number one, the need for insurers to be responsive to consumers. Um, I think the companies that are reacting quickly and dynamically and decisively are gaining benefit from doing so because it's reassuring customers and helping address unmet needs. But to be close to customers means you need to regularly engage and have the tools to do so to build those strengths of relationship and those insights. So that's one piece I think is absolutely critical. The second piece to those insights is then how you use them to create relevance that's targeted to the needs of the customer. I think that's critical. And then from there, to be responsive to those changes and dynamic requires you to declutter both the way you present yourself externally to make you easy to interact with and use, but also internally in terms of speed of decision making. Organizations that are significantly layered and take a long time to make decisions will not be able to respond to consumer needs in the appropriate timings. So I think those things for an insurer are one, simplifying their processes so they can make decisions quicker and respond to customers in a simple way that is easy for them. Two, deepening the customer relationship and engagement, uh, which generates insights that enable you to be relevant. And linked to all of that is clearly that digital and digitization to enable you to do that in a scaled way, but also it supports that simplicity. I think all of those things are important. And the last learning from personal perspective is the need to be decisive and have courage. In a situation like this, it's hard to predict what's going to happen next. Nobody absolutely knows with certainty, but you can start to see things that you have confidence will change. And this is the right time to see the disruption, see the opportunity and therefore invest, but most importantly also change and adapt to the new market situation we face. Yeah, right. Uh, speaking about telehealth or telemedicine, yep. how is Cigna covering telehealth or telemedicine services for clients, especially during this pandemic? Yeah, so for telehealth, we've done two or three things. We pride ourselves on it. We felt that we, we, didn't want to, we wanted to make sure that we played to what we knew would be clinically the right things to do for customers to keep them health, healthy and make them comfortable and also not to cause alarm. So the first thing we did was switch on telehealth and make it available to all of our customers. So a customer of Cigna could access those services. The second thing, and that was to mean that they wouldn't feel worried about having to go to a hospital to get some of the treatments they needed. They wouldn't have to worry about, well, who do I talk to? Uh, do I need to go to a clinic? Do I need to go to a hospital? We wanted to make all that available to give peace of mind. But secondly, access. Um, so that was a big thing. To address the affordability, we then also, with our product designs, made sure that the cost of access was waived. So traditionally, you may have fees for accessing services, but the telehealth service to be accessed, we made that, we took away all those co-pays, as we'd call them, the fee structures, to enable someone to be able to access that service um, dynamically and effectively. And then finally, we spent a lot of time making sure we promoted that to customers. And then we took different ways of doing it. So not only promoting it, so please use, we also then were very proactive that with customers with chronic diseases or customers with existing health conditions with regular drug treatments needed, we were then proactively reaching out to them saying, how can we make sure those drugs are being delivered to you without you needing to go to a hospital to get them? So we did all of those things. And as a result of those actions combined, uh, globally, we've seen about a 500% uptake in the use of this service. And again, tying back to other thoughts, I, I think this is the future and making um, healthcare accessible, but also in this way affordable. So this is a big focus for us, but it's an area where I'm very proud across our region, how we've stepped up to make sure these services are available to customers and reassure them during what has been a very challenging period of time. Mm, yeah, I understand. And uh, do you think that this will remain for a longer term since you mentioned that this uh, telehealth and telemedicine is increasing mm. massively, especially during the period? And do you think it will remain for long term? 
yeah, it's, it, again, I'm in the land of predictions, so challenging. Um, my personal view and what I'd like to hope is that customers who get used to that service and enjoy that service, so imagine, and, and it, I do think there'll be different uh, reactions by different types of people and different locations, but I, I look at it as an example. If I'm uh, remotely uh, away from hospitals and clinics, and now I have something reliable that gives me confidence that I've tried, that means I could speak to someone in the next five or 10 minutes, I on the back of that will have drugs delivered to my home without me leaving my home and I'll get the quality of health care uh, care um, and service from that application and that's a springboard to do many other services over time I do think there are a number of people who will embrace that especially as we get more and more comfortable with technology and we know from our surveys uh, consumers are willing to share so much more data now on their health because they want the right interventions they want timely support that's in an accessible, affordable way. So my view is that broadly, I'd like to think that this is going to make healthcare just so much more accessible for people and people are really gonna embrace it. I, I do think there's gonna be some people who may say on occasion, actually I want the reassurance of seeing someone face to face uh, and spending time with them. But I broadly think that we're gonna to start to see some of the behavior change now become permanent. I also think that even after COVID-19 tapers down, as we've seen this summer, it's as it's reared its head again people will be very cautious and so as people uh, get more and more used to doing this and will become more cautious in their lives going forward i think the um impact of this and the likelihood of this being enduring is much greater yeah i agree and um do you think what will be the consequences of the pandemic be in short medium and long term for the businesses Wow. <laughs> wow, that's a really good question. Um, I think uh, there are a number of things. I think um, there's going to be a lot of work going into how do organisations and how do bigger organisations, governments and the like, prepare for pandemics. So I think we're going to see a much deeper think thoughts around this and programmes. And as many world leaders have talked about there, we're sort of reinventing their model as they go, responding dynamically to these changes. So I think that's going to be big. I think in the short term, I actually think we will see lower incidences of claims and people um, actually consuming uh, some of the services, um, apart from those they consume remotely because they'd be very cautious. I believe that will rebound over time. But what I also think is a result of this pandemic, it's going to change some of the behaviours. Now, some of those behaviours are going to impact other industries quite significantly. So how people buy uh, products in the future, um, how often they want to interact face to face in retail brick and mortar buildings. I do think we're going to see changes there. I do think we're going to see work from home become a much bigger new norm. I think people are going to be much more mobile as workers. So that's a big change. Um, and I also think that the way people think about insurance and the types of services is going to change a lot. I think much deeper focus on, on chronic disease, much bigger focus on preventing illness, and also preparing through inoculation and other types of services as well. These are going to be some of the changes, um, but in the short term, I think people are going to be incredibly cautious, and it's going to change some of the way people interact and how they work, the way they live their lives a little bit, to be honest. Yeah, and do you think how prepared is the insurance, uh, health insurance industry, especially for contagious diseases just like COVID-19? Yeah, I think, I mean, number one, externally to the health insurance industry, there's going to be a lot more work on planning for pandemics in the future. So that is going to revise a lot. Um, I think people have felt as they've gone through this, maybe people could have been more prepared than they were. So I think you're going to have that, that change. I think the second piece that we're going to see is that health insurers will continue to assess the types of risks they take on and how they can play an even more active role. And I think the use of technology is going to be so critical. And we've seen it with tracing apps uh, and the like. So how to provide information in a much more timely fashion to consumers going forward to support them and how to monitor very quickly on an ongoing basis people's health care, their vital signs, etc. So personally, I imagine seeing a lot more digital focus going forward um, and a lot more remote servicing. But I also think we're going to see a lot more folks around particular types of proposition and typical types of interventions as well. 
Yeah. And then for post COVID-19, is there any plans, especially for Signa, to have partnership with pharmas to make more drugs accessible to consumers? Yeah, I mean, look, I mean, we continue to seek to find ways to partner, be it with providers to help us build the relevant programs to support customers and pharmaceutical organizations. So we will continue to explore based on the customer insights we have and based on the unmet needs, anything that will have, um, really put forward three items on the agenda for healthcare. Number one, making sure healthcare is affordable. And um, that's really important for us. Number two, the predictability of healthcare. As mentioned, healthcare is really opaque. So how do we make sure customers know what they're gonna spend and then that's exactly what happens rather than something in between. And finally, how do we make that simple? Any partners that can help us on that journey? We still have three more questions. Okay. Um, yeah, the, ne the next question would be, what is the impact of the pandemic in the health insurance premium? Yeah, good. <laughs> Very good question, um, and it's very uncertain. I think in the short term, reality is that um, healthcare premiums are, and health insurers are trying to address this question entirely, which is, I would expect to see some claims decline in the short term, uh, because people are, are not going to hospitals, particularly to have what, what I reference as elective treatments, um, and healthcare insurers obviously investing a lot of money to provide other services um, and so reinvesting heavily to support. And then I think in the longer term, clearly we'll see a bounce back on claims and people accessing services much more in a very quick period. Uh, but for me, again, when I think about healthcare premiums, depending on the insurer, our perspective would be quite straightforward, which is our focus is on the affordability of healthcare and making it sustainable. And so while the industry at large will, will work through this, uh, from our perspective, we're gonna be working on how do we make sure that we're addressing the needs of our consumers um, in terms of the unmet needs, making the services more digital. But secondly, how are we also um, making sure we continue to make this affordable in terms of the way we deliver healthcare services, the quality of them, how do we intervene earlier to help people stay healthy and not become ill? And I think those things are going to be at the heart of making sure in the long term, healthcare is affordable, um, healthcare is accessible, healthcare is simple, and it's predictable. Yeah, uh, talking about the cover, what insurance plan must now cover with regard of COVID-19 testing and treatments? Uh, can you just say the question again? I'm very sorry. It's just now I'm in a different position. I can't hear you quite so well. <laughs> <laughs> is it okay now can you yeah yeah that's it? perfect thank you yeah uh, what insurance plan must now cover with regard of COVID-19 testing and treatments yeah so from from for our plans we took the step of um, making COVID related um, testing but also for consumers that were then obviously diagnosed with the, those types of treatments we also were making sure that our coverage expanded to cover those um, types of benefits. So in the event that you contracted COVID-19, we would, we would also cover that. That continues to be the case right now and continues to be our focus because again, we wanna make sure that we're supporting our consumers in making um, the protection that they need available to them. Um, many different insurers reacted in different ways. I've seen different uh, responses across uh, Asia in particular. Uh, but again, our perspective is that it's important um, to address these needs. And this is a once in a, a lifetime event. And it's important to give customers the protection and the security that they need and peace of mind. And so we have personally extended those services um, to make sure that people um, feel supported, but are able to um, have peace of mind. Yeah, we have our very final question here. Okay. So the final question would be, what are the main lessons learned from especially health insurance business can take from this crisis? Yeah, um, I mean, the, the key ones for me, and again, I have some bias, and is it just health insurance or wider? But again, I'd emphasize how important it is to be close to your customers and understand them 
and as a result being able to respond to their needs and i think organizations that do that consumer orientated customers like that that are very customer centric have an advantage so my learning has been how important it is to be close to your customers how important as a result is to be responsive to your customers needs and so how we do that and how we use those insights to very dramatically um, support them over time so my overriding thoughts are acceleration of digitization to make um, access to healthcare simpler and make it easier um, i think secondly um, being close to our customers and understanding them leveraging those insights to provide solutions that are relevant but most importantly then being able to act quickly and if i think about our response from having our employees able to work from home in less than 48 hours during what is a considerably disruptive period, our ability to provide access to telehealth to customers across the globe, and the ability to get pharmacy deliveries to them, so medication, all of those responses I think um, are key, have been able to be done because we are close to customers, we understand what customers' needs are evolving, and we have structures that enable us to respond super quickly. Uh, and then to really digitize that pace. And so all of these things are gonna be critical for insurers going forward. And in the health space, the big lesson is, we always talk about affordability being a problem. We talk about the need to make sure healthcare is sustainable and affordable. The economic impacts of COVID-19, the concerns customers have, have just put affordability further up the agenda. And so for me, for healthcare insurers, the pursuit of that initiative and about making healthcare affordable, making it predictable and making it simple have just gone further up the agenda and customers are going to be seeking that on a go forward position. Great, that was a really incredible answer to all those questions that we have. Um, so moving on, does anyone has any further questions to make? I think we ran out of time now. Uh, Julian, is there anything else you wanted to cover before wrap up? Yeah, maybe maybe quickly. I just want to make sure I don't uh, lose my my connection. So let me just make sure I'm plugged in. Um, but yeah, look, firstly, I'd like to just extend a huge you know thank you to everyone who's attended. I apologise for disruption, but I'm sure everyone can appreciate during COVID nineteen the multiple locations we're in that we have to adapt. So thank you for bearing with me and adapting. Um, I want to share some quick observations just to close this up. Um, firstly, stress has become a prevalent part of our lives. Anxi anxiety, to your point, has become more pronounced due to the pandemic. Um, at Cigna, our ambition is to help people change their behaviour and start to own the stress care um, by taking care of their stress. And I think by doing that, that's potentially in the long term going to help them avoid some of these serious chronic illnesses, uh, which can develop from unmanaged chronic uh, stress. We're also working on employer clients to spend time on building strategies to create a healthier remote working arrangements, which could never be more important than now uh, for both the physical and mental well-being of the employees. Um, and our way of dealing with that is to introduce things such as regular check-ins to just sense check how are people doing, making sure they're okay. And maybe I'd give two or three sort of recommendations at the end. I mean, first, exercise is really important. Get those endorphins racing around your body frenetically it's a fantastic way of reducing stress even if you're remotely working from home try to take that mental break you know have a you know have a time to stroll outside um do some exercise virtually but it's great for your mind number two take a break one of the fastest ways of reducing stress is to remove you from a stressful situation however temporarily so continue to take regular breaks and don't get in the trap of from you know from duvet to sofa and work through the day make sure you're taking those regular breaks check in posture but keep it simple and effective and remain connected more than ever it's important that whilst we're at home and we're all doing our own things that we keep connected and making sure that you make that effort with your colleagues friends family to drop that whatsapp make that phone call but to check in with them and make sure they're well and keep connected because a common source of stress is not feeling in control a common source of stress is having no control over your job and your nature. As I shared at the start, 20% of um, um, illness is linked to stress. So there is a link between stress and ongoing chronic disease. 
I really urge us as a group to address it. And this pandemic has just, to your point earlier, raised the emphasis on this and how that stress will be building. So again, as an employer, make the effort to check in um, with your employees, with your friends and with your family, and make sure if you're working from home that you're taking those breaks, you remain connected, and that finally you're giving yourself some time away from it all, which is very difficult in this situation. But I really appreciate the opportunity to chat through today uh, and have this engagement. Yeah, great. Thank you very much, Julian, for the wonderful presentation and all those tips. Surely I will be exercising more regularly from now on. <laughs> Okay, thank you everyone. We really appreciate you being here. Please uh, apologize for the inconvenient cause just now happened, but overall the presentation was great. I hope everyone can take away a lot of things to learn uh, from this session. Um, thanks again for joining us today. So thank you, Julian, for being a very great presentation today. Uh, thank you and we will see you next time. Thank you very Bye. much.